It's a great honor for me to be here at the Empire Club of Canada today, which is arguably the most famous and historically relevant speaker's podium to have ever existed in Canada. It has offered its podium to such international luminaries as Winston Churchill, Ronald Reagan, Audrey Hepburn, the Dalai Lama, Indira Gandhi, and closer to home, from Pierre Trudeau to Justin Trudeau. Literally generations of our great nation's leaders, alongside with those of the world's top international diplomats, heads of state, and business and thought leaders. It is a real honor and a distinct privilege to be invited to speak to the Empire Club of Canada, which has been welcoming international diplomats, leaders in business and in science and in politics. And when they stand at that podium, they speak not only to the entire country, but they can speak to the entire world. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Empire Club of Canada the country's go-to forum for conversations that matter for 120 years and counting. To formally begin this afternoon, I want to acknowledge that we're gathering today on the traditional and treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the homelands of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Their stewardship of this land, profound cultural heritage, and continued connection to these territories are essential parts of Toronto's identity. We encourage everyone to learn more about the traditional territory on which you work and live. This is an essential step to reconciliation, and each and every one of us has a role to play. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome our distinguished guests. We have Skylar Park, Olympian, Pan American champion, and Paris qualified Taekwondo athlete. David Shoemaker, Chief Executive Officer of the Canadian Olympic Committee. And Bruni Surin, Team Canada's Chef to Mission for Paris 2024. In a conversation moderated by Devin Haru, reporter, CBC News and CBC Sports. Welcome to the Empire Club, everyone. It's an honor to have you. The Empire Club of Canada is a not-for-profit organization, and we'd like to recognize our sponsors who made this event possible and complimentary for our online viewers to attend. Thank you to our lead event sponsors, RBC, Bell, Canadian Tire, and Lululemon. And thank you to our supporting sponsor, Air Canada. Lastly, thank you to our season sponsors, AWS, Bruce Power, and Hydro One. As a uh, club of record, all Empire Club of Canada events are available on demand on our website. As always, we accept questions from the audience for our speakers, and for those of you in the room, you can undertake to scan that QR code found in your program and our online attendees can use the question box underneath the video player. This uh, has to be one of my favorite events this season. I'm always asked, but this stands up there. First, we uh, get a sneak peek behind the scenes of the 2024, uh, Paris 2024 Olympic Games, uh, with, which I believe is an incredible opportunity. You know, we have more than 350 Canadian athletes that are heading to Paris in July. We get to wish them luck and also learn about the ins and outs of Canada's participation at the biggest multi-sport event on earth. Second, sport has this magic power of bringing us all together. We talked about this earlier upstairs, we were doing the book signing. You know, it unites nations, generations, and transcends all differences. This summer in Paris, thousands of athletes will show, up, show us the power of fair competition, of diversity, and inclusion, and of unity, and to show us in the room, everywhere, and the millions of people like us around the world, the folks coming together to cheer for these athletes and to celebrate their success. You know, in a world marked by polarization and conflict, 
the Olympics is one of the few unifying events that we have. And honestly, looking at the world right now, there are a few more inspiring things than that. You know, today we um, get to celebrate our incredible Team Canada, the work of our Olympic Committee and Canada's achievements and future aspirations. We also get to applaud our athletes. You are role models for all of us and especially for the younger generations. And a special shout out, we have students and athletes who are joining us from Humber College here in the Greater Toronto Area and Queen's University, Kingston, where it's great to have you here. And to those athletes, you, you show us uh, what we can accomplish if we dream bigger and strive for greatness, so thank you. At uh, the Empire Club of Canada, we believe that it's only through meaningful, inspiring and unifying conversations that we can move forward. I uh, look forward to hearing from our distinguished guests. Thank you again for your work and your tireless dedication to Canada. I'd now like to take this opportunity to welcome to the stage David Haru, Skylar Park, David Shoemaker, and Bruni Surin. Thank you. When we see Maggie McNeil, she's an Olympic gold medalist gliding through the pool. What we don't see is a person who refuses to let anxiety keep her from the starting block. When we see Shay Gilgis Alexander, the man's unstoppable. What we don't see is a skinny kid who got cut from his high school team. We don't see Maud Sharon being forced to change weight classes after she won Olympic gold. Ellie Black hearing she's just too old to compete as she prepares for her fourth Olympic Games. Or Andre de Grasse dealing with all the doubters, including himself. What we don't see makes these athletes who they are. What we don't see makes us all who we are. We're all bravely facing the odds in our lives, and our bravery is our victory. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is an honor to be here. Devin Haru with CBC Sports. Uh, absolutely thrilled to be alongside this powerhouse team here today. Uh, a note on that, it's the first time we've really collaborated, David, uh, in such a meaningful way on this campaign ad, Brave is Unbeatable. And a, and a quick note on it, you know, we have Michael J. Fox uh, doing the English version of it, his voice. Uh, and what a hero he is in our country, but s exactly. Uh, and, and Celine Dion uh, voicing the, the French version. And in our newsroom, as we were going through this, you know, NBC has their superstars and their glitzy. I said, I'd put our athletes, Michael J. Fox and Celine Dion, up against anybody <laughs> in the world. So yeah. uh, outstanding on that. Uh, we are 64 days away from the Olympics. We are 97 days away from the Paralympics. What a time to be a, a fan of sports in this country. A WNBA announcement in the city today. This place is buzzing. Uh, so let's get into it. Skylar Park, it's exactly a year ago today uh, I rolled out a feature on your family. Listen to this, a family of 16 black belt members, uh, three generations of, of Taekwondo athletes, uh, with a slogan, a family that kicks together, sticks together. <laughs> Skylar Park is getting ready to go to her second Olympics and the first with fans in the stands. Skylar, how are you? And wonderful to see you. I know, it's wonderful to see you too. I'm so excited to be here today. Um, it's an honor to be on this panel alongside all these incredible um, people and men, I guess. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I'm super excited. Like you said, we're just days away from the Olympics, um, but who's counting? <laughs> right. I am. You are. I know you are. What is it like uh, to be in such a different place? Uh, the extraordinary hurdles and challenges you face, their house has been overhauled into a dojo, literally. Um, so you're, you're doing your training and that in the midst of a pandemic. Now you're, you're able to move freely and train freely. How, how much of a difference has that been? I think it's a huge difference. I, th I think seeing the preparation um, from uh, Tokyo compared to now for Paris, um, it's like night and day. And I think 
with that is, is partially because we were preparing in, in the midst of COVID. Um, but then also just, I think, having competed at an Olympic Games and having experienced that, although mm. everyone who's been to ones before says that wasn't the real thing. Right. Um, <laughs> so I'm excited for Paris, but um, I think just having that Olympic experience under my belt and kind of knowing what to expect and just the growth and, and things that I learned from being in Tokyo, and I think I'm carrying forward with me a lot um, of new things coming into Paris and just a different perspective and a different way of preparation. I think for myself as well as my dad, like he's, like you said, um, it's a whole family thing and my dad's been my coach since um, I could walk, um, before that probably. Um, but so I think it's interesting because he's been, a, he's never coached at this high performance level until I competed at this level. And so every time that I was learning something new, he was as well as a coach. Wow. Um, and so I think for both of us, having experienced um, the Olympic Games for the first time, um, we're both carrying a new perspective and new preparation into Paris for sure. Nice. Uh, Jay, your father, Jay yes. Park, uh, <laughs> five decades ago started <clears throat> in Korea as a, a Taekwondo black belt master and now carrying that tradition here in Canada and Winnipeg, exceptional. David, uh, congratulations to you and the entire Canadian Olympic Committee. Uh, this brand, this team is everywhere. What's it like to be leading this at a time when it feels like there's real momentum around our athletes in this country? It's a dream, Devin. Yeah. Um, I've had the pleasure of working in sport for over two decades mm -hmm. now. And, uh, and in some pretty cool sports. I worked with the Women's Tennis Association for seven years, also the NBA for seven years meant I got to work with the likes of Serena Williams, Maria Sharapova, Stephen Curry, and LeBron James. I put Canadian Olympians up against any athlete I've ever worked, at, worked with. There's something that makes them tick, the drive, the character, the integrity about Canadian Olympians. It's just incredible. I, I'm sitting here next to friggin' Bruni Sir. <laughs> we introduce him as the chef de mission for Paris 2024. He's like, um, excuse me, everyone. <laughs> You know, he, he, he won one of the most important gold medals in Canadian Olympic history yes. in Atlanta in 1996. It's, uh, and a plug for Air Canada, which shows the, yep. the documentary on it. I encourage you to watch it. And then this next generation of athletes, Skylar's incredible. I watched her become the Pan American champion in, in Santiago and then immediately go from that into a Taekwondo club and inspire a generation of Chilean kids with her whole family. It's just incredible. And so the third ranked Taekwondo athlete in the world, and she's got her sights set on some very big goals in Paris and where the, <laughs> our job is to do everything we can do to support them. And it gives me great pride and joy every single day. Wonderful, we're yeah. gonna get more into that and the planning that the Canadian Olympic Committee is doing. Uh, Bruni, the man, one of the men who made us love Saturday nights in Georgia. Uh, <laughs> you and I have had many conversations since you were named Chef de Mission. I don't know if there's a more proud Canadian. When you reflect on that moment uh, that David mentioned, 1996, I love the answer and I would love the club to hear it today about what you said as, as you evolved and come to understand what that meant to the hearts and minds of Canadians because there were moments that made you realize how much of a turning point that was for Canada. Yes, uh, after 96, of course, that we, uh, we celebrated uh, Canada. I was uh, on the podium hearing the Canadian anthem and see the flag raised and everything. So it was so much uh, emotion. And sometimes people ask me, uh, how did I feel? And it's almost that I was, I was going to, to, to faint that moment. It was, was, it was huge. And years later, I remember I was uh, giving a conference and somebody came to me and said, I remember where I was, what I was doing when we won the gold medal. And I was like, wait a minute. That person just say we, we as as a Canadian, and now as a chef de mission, I can see it back. I see you guys. I talked to a lot of you uh, before we came here, and you guys, the excitement, the support that you guys are giving. You are part of that team. It's not myself. 
it's not only a Skyler, it's, it's, it's us as Canadian. And one thing I said also, I want us to be even more uh, unite. And that's the power of wearing this. When you wear this, I'm wearing this and I can I feel like I'm, I want to run back. He, he, I think you're ready to go. <laughs> I'm ready to go. We might meet you in the, in, in the third leg in Paris. <laughs> it's like, guys, I mean, uh, and going, go, going there is going to be, he's going to be so excited. Some of you is going to be there. Some of you is going to watch it on, 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 on TV. And what you guys are doing, it's like great. We, we as athletes, ex-athletes, future athletes, again, we, we feel that and we appreciate and we want to, to thank you all also for that. Bruni, you've been everywhere, and, and just to know, I'm sure every one of us in this room probably know it was a where were you when moment when that team won. That, that summer in 96, what you guys did, I think, and I've said this to you many times, was a real turning point. Uh, chef de mission, how, how do you describe that? Because some people I've talked to think you cook for the team. <laughs> It's not cooking. Not for once. Not once. <laughs> not once. I, I cannot uh, cook. D d describe your role, because uh, I think you've said cheerleader, all of these things, but but you wear many hats and you're supporting our team. Yes, I'm, uh, this is a role that I, I take very. Uh, I, I didn't take it for granted. I, I really appreciate it. It would be like to be uh, saying that the spokesperson of the of uh, of the team. And uh, I know that all the athletes, they have the support uh, already, the coach and everything. We kind of, in the background, if you need anything, advice. I've participated at four Olympics. I had great moment and also had moment that was very difficult. So I can, I can share my stories to the, to the athletes. The role also is, I say that with all humility, uh, to try to inspire as much as athlete, uh, coaches, federation that I, that I can. And this is a work that I've been starting to do like a year ago, like I went to, example, World Championship and canoe kayak. I met the athletes, I met the coaches, the federation, and I want us to create that relationship. So once I'm going to be in Paris as a spokesperson, let's say, chef de mission, I want to know as much as athlete as, as, I, as I can. And of course, in Paris, you're going to see me <laughs> yelling and cheering the, the athletes, and that's going, to be, that's going to be amazing. That's the, the role of the chef de mission. Outstanding, Bruni. Uh, Skyler, you uh, have been so revealing, and it's been a, a wonderful thing to see you open up about your relationship with expectations and pressure. Uh, no greater pressure than on the biggest athletic stage in the world. Maybe share with the audience a little bit about how you've navigated really becoming the poster person for Taekwondo in this country, the, the great expectations going into Tokyo, resetting after that, and now getting ready to go in, into the Paris Olympics with a different perspective. Take, take our audience through that, because you speak really eloquently on that. Yeah, I think it's, it's been a long journey for sure. I mean, I stepped onto the world stage for the first time in 2016 when I won the Junior World Championships. Um, and after that, World Taekwondo um, kind of put me out there as the new face of Taekwondo, um, the one that was going to come and beat all these past Olympians. Um, and so I think I then transitioned into being a senior athlete and came on the scene. Um, and I mean, I did well, um, but I didn't maybe do quite as well as everyone had hoped. And I think um, part of that was dealing with that pressure and, and, and the expectations of, I think at that time it was the world of Taekwondo. Um, and so um, I struggled with that a lot. And I mean, I was performing well enough um, but I wasn't performing up to my potential um, and what my dad and I knew that I was capable of, of doing. Um, and that was hard for a long time to kind of always feel like you were, I mean, I was on the podium, but I was like, in my own mind, I was falling short. Mm. Um, and so I think I struggled with that a lot. And then leading into um, Tokyo, I was very grateful. I had a lot of support from incredible partners like we have here um, and a lot of support from the Canadian Olympic Committee. Um, and there was some hype around that, I'd say. Um, like you said, I was the only athlete at the time qualified in Taekwondo. Um, I'd been the only athlete who'd won a world championship medal in 10 or so years um, in the sport um, from Canada. And so I think there was a lot of expectation there that I struggled with in leading into Tokyo, I think. I think if you, if you talk to a lot of athletes, everyone shows up to the Olympics physically at their best. And everyone's physical best is 
pretty similar. The margin of error isn't super huge um, for most people. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the biggest thing is, is that mental, dealing with the pressures, dealing with the expectations, dealing with all those things that come with being on the Olympic stage. Um, and I think people can prepare you for it. And some people go into their first Olympics and, and have incredible results. Um, but for me, I think having that experience of being out there and knowing what all that feels like um, was huge. And so I feel like I didn't really quite deal with those emotions and things going into Tokyo as well as maybe I should have. Um, and so I think as soon as I stepped onto the mats, um, especially being in an empty stadium that was silent, you could hear a pin drop, um, all those emotions just kind of like flooded me at once while being on the mat fighting. Mm -hmm. um, and knowing that the world was watching and I was losing and, and all those things and it kind of spiraled and didn't end up having great results. Mm. Um, so I think starting from that point leading into um, the quad of, or I guess the three years, the three, leading into Paris. It happened fast. Yes, it was very quick. Um, but that was the main focus for my team and I, um, just working on dealing with those mental pressures. And, and a huge thing I talked about earlier today, we were at a school. Um, a huge thing was just going back to why I fell in love with the sport from the beginning. Nice. Um, and just finding joy in what I was doing again. Um, it came to a head last year when I was competing in Paris at a Grand Prix, and um, I, I, I bombed like my fourth competition in a row, and I was like, I didn't know if I was gonna qualify at that point. Hmm. Um, and I, I told my parents, which was hard to do, but I was like, I'm, like I, I don't like this anymore, hmm. um, which is a hard thing to admit when you've been doing it for so long. Um, and I think it was just because I, I put so much pressure on myself every time I stepped onto the mat that there was so much pressure eventually that I just didn't want to be there at all. Wow. Um, and so I learned how to get past that and I found a lot of joy in what I was doing again. And I, I love to fight, I love to be on the mats and, and perform for an audience. And I love the sport from the beginning because I did it with all my family and I still have the privilege of doing that to this day. Um, and so after that and after kind of realizing that while I was in Paris, somehow of it just places, happened, happened to me. Right. <laughs> um, I was able to really come out from that and have a really successful second half of my season um, where I didn't lose a match. <laughs> um, wow. So yeah, and I solidified my Paris qualification and just kind of carrying that momentum into this year. Um, but yeah, it's, it's something that I think as athletes we continue to kind of have to work on and, and deal with, but I, I feel like I'm, I'm working on it well. <laughs> Uh, you're, you're seeing evidence of this today, but as someone who follows our athletes all over the world, uh, I have always thought that our athletes are the greatest, some of the greatest ambassadors of our country. Uh, I'll never know what it's like to, to kick with the power Skylar does, but there is a relatability of what you just shared that I think reminds us all of our hopes and dreams of what we're trying to do in our life. So thank you for that, Skylar. Um, David, I'm thinking about since you've taken over, you have faced some challenges yep. in your role. You haven't gone to a games where uh, it hasn't been geopolitical or it hasn't been a pandemic or you've wondered if it's even going to happen or a year delay. Uh, what's it been like for you personally to ride this out with the support of your partners and the sport infrastructure in this country to now come on the other side of this where it really feels like we're going into a French renaissance. This is going to be a party and a celebration this summer, but man, has it been a go for you yeah, since yeah. taking over. It's, it's funny when you reflect on it. Right. Uh, and I often look forward rather than back, but... Uh, when you reflect on it, there have been some things that we've had to overcome. So, Skylar, you know, Tokyo was my warm-up games, too, I guess. <laughs> right. um, and they were beautiful in so many ways when I think about the things that I got to go and do and witness, in many cases alone, or with Marnie McBean, our chef de mission. It was, you know, Marnie McBean and me and Marnie's drum at yeah. <laughs> empty stadiums all around Tokyo. You know, that, that some, and the stories and the memories that Marnie and I will share. So I look back fondly to the Tokyo Games and the 24 medals and the incredible performances, and yet these Paris Games are the games we've been waiting for and building for. 
um, so that we'll finally be able to welcome our incredible partners. We've seen you know, four, four or five of them up on the screen and, and thank them for their incredible support. They'll be able to come to Paris and experience it with us, our donors. And we have uh, some amazing donors who are helping keep this incredible Canadian Olympic dream alive. I, I don't know that many people in this room would fully understand that we are almost entirely privately funded organization, a right. 50-ish million dollar P&L annually. And it all comes through the generosity of our marketing partners and our donors. I think it's often thought that we're government supported and that it's you know, the federal government run, uh, but it's not. Uh, so we get to welcome these people with us and your friends and your families and, and we're gonna have the largest Maison Olympique du Canada, our, our version of Canada Olympic House in Paris. It's just gonna be wonderful. Um, from somebody in my role, it adds an incredible amount of complexity. Right. Uh, it, 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 and yet I relish that. I mean, it, it, and for me personally, it's, it's almost as though I started this job all over again this year. <laughs> and so it's allowed me to think about this as a little bit of a rebirth, a chance to sort of do it all over again, but with a completely different lens on everything we're doing. So, um, yeah, I, I think of it in a very positive way, Devin. Uh, you have so many conversations with partners, uh, the IOC, uh, the organizing committee in Paris, the Canadian athletes. What's your sense on where everybody is at 64 days out? Yeah, everyone wants to start right. 64 days out. I think there's no question. This is sort of the season, I was told this would occur, I remember somebody saying, in Sochi there was this, you know, the Black Widow, and I was like, there were spiders in Sochi? <laughs> they know there was you know, a cyber attack or something. But right. there's always something in the lead up to the mm -hmm. games that people latch on to and, and try to use as a reason to, to criticize or to right. suggest that there's something that we shouldn't cheer for. And yet, um, Sal said it so incredibly well. There are so few things that unite and bring people together in a spirit of peace these days, the Olympic Games is a wonderful thing. Um, and, and, and so uh, for me, uh, looking forward to that um, is, is really the, the motivation uh, for the whole team, yeah. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, Bruni, you mentioned it, four Olympics. I don't know how well known it is that your first Olympics in 1988, you were a long jumper. And then eight years later, you were winning Olympic gold as a sprinter. It is remarkable to me that you are this athletic marvel, but I wonder uh, mentally, spiritually, energetically, the pivot and the resilience and everything that goes into that, into literally going from a long jumper to a sprinter and being excellent. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I think those, those experiences and leadership uh, notes are gonna be so crucial for our team the pivot and the resilience and all of that. Yes, uh, actually my first Olympic uh, 88 as a long jumper, um, I was injured, uh, my ankle. So every time I was on the step on the board to jump, it was hurt like so uh, incredibly. So I finished uh, 12th or 14th, long time ago. You can see my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but uh, when I was running, I didn't, I didn't feel uh, the pain and my, my coach and I, and you know, I just said to my coach, well, I think that the next season, I want to focus on, on, on sprinting. So after that, um, to try to get in the competition in Europe, um, I went to, uh, to live uh, in Italy because I had a, my, my dream was, was very high. And I remember all my friends were telling me, why are you doing this? You're gonna go all the way in Italy by yourself, living in a house, by myself, I uh, was in Siena, uh, two hours north of, uh, of Italy. And the only thing I was doing, like the morning, I go up the hill, train in the sandy track, go back home, uh, make my lunch, rest, and the afternoon go to the, to the stadium. And on weekends, I was trying to get in competition. Hmm. And uh, a lot of athletes were laughing at me. I mean, some uh, promoters, was shutting the door, saying that I'm, I'm not strong enough. Uh, there's some occasion I was just sleeping on the uh, athlete's room because I wasn't uh, inviting everything. But I kept, I kept the dream here. I said, I have to go through this. And uh, resilience is what? What's the definition of resilience? So you, you're going through this, and you know things are going to get better. You have to keep 
working, keep working, keep working. And actually, to make a story short, um, it's uh, 15 years after that I had that dream, uh, actually to be faster than my idol. You know who my idol was at that time? Uh, Carl Lewis, <coughs> who won four gold medals. And uh, I saw him on TV. I said, well, I want to be uh, like him. And everybody was, uh, was laughing. So sometimes the power of the, the Olympics and everything, I mean, like you, Skyler, there's a, a lot of young kids like they're going to look at you. They're already looking at you. They say, oh, in the future, I want to be like Skyler. So that those kind of, of things, it's like, it's, 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 uh, it's amazing. So all the thing that I can share to the, to the athletes is like, when you have a, your dream, keep on, keep, keep it there. Whether you go through challenges and everything, it's tough. It's not, it's not easy, but you have to keep, keep, keep the goal here and you can do it. And look at you now. Uh, by the way, we had Bruni into our CBC Sports Department the other day. We have a wall of champions and he, we got him to sign the wall and he put 9.84. Put some respect <laughs> on that Canadian record. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, we're winding down, but I've been told we, we're getting uh, some questions in here, so I'll look at this. This one's for David right now. Uh, let me read this in real time. We're doing this live, David. Here we go. Overseeing the upcoming generation of Olympians, how do you see the future funding model for young athletes evolving? More government support, more corporate partnership support, parents? Uh, it's a good question, David. What does that look like as we uh, s financially support our athletes? Because, of course, uh, we, we know that that has been a topic of conversation. Yeah, and a topic of frustration. Right. Um, I think Canadian athletes are woefully underfunded, mm -hmm. even with a recent bump in what we call their carding money. Um, but the sports system, so as much as we are privately funded, the 61 national sports organizations that are the bedrock of sport in this country, that set the programs and the policies for sport in this country, they're largely, I say largely because there's maybe 10 of them that, that are able to have a, a viable commercial product. They're largely funded by the federal government, and there hasn't been an increase in nearly 20 years. So the, the power of what they were given back in 2005 has been eroded by inflation by 50%. They're being asked to do more and more and more with less and less. So what do you do? We've therefore not expected to see that increase in the future and are planning that we have to do a better job with our marketing partners at getting a bit more funding. We have to be more efficient with what we get. And this is the part that I'm especially optimistic about, is tapping into the generosity of Canadians in a way that we haven't yet quite figured out before, with, uh, but we're seeing it. Um, we're seeing our, 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 the Canadian Olympic Foundation raise more money than we ever before, real generosity, and it's making a difference. Uh, that, uh, and we, you know, we see south of the border where their foundation is four, five, six times the size of ours. We think we can get there. Um, and that's really what I think is going to have to be part of the impetus to us getting to a place where our athletes and our sports are better funded. Yeah, it, it, it's a great answer. And Skylar, I want to go right to you on that because I think you're making a trip to one of your sponsors later today. Um, how crucial is that to be able to do what you do? I was inside your house. Tegu and Braven, your brothers, they're training as well. Mom, Andrea, is trying to keep everything going. Dad's there. How crucial of lifeline is that for, for your entire family to be able to be on this sporting journey? Yeah, I think it is for sure. I mean, um, I've been grateful to have um, wonderful sponsors who've supported me and continue to support me throughout my journey um, as an athlete. But like you said, it's it, me, it's my two brothers. Um, our family has dedicated, essentially my parents have dedicated their lives to help us to achieve our dreams. Um, I don't know if my dad would choose this lifestyle if, if it wasn't for us. <laughs> Um, but they've, they've sacrificed so much because we have huge dreams and huge goals and, and they're willing to um, support us to achieve them. And, and like you said, um, my, my parents also, my dad, my family runs a Taekwondo school in Winnipeg and in order to help pay for what we want to do, 
um, they, they have to run a successful business as well. And so I was chatting earlier when you were in Winnipeg and, and we were training and someone came into the academy, my dad had to leave training to go help yeah. them out, right? And you go, what's happening? I said, well, we don't have a business, we can't compete, <laughs> right? right. Um, <laughs> so no, but so it's very, very crucial. Um, as an athlete, for sure. Nice. Uh, Devin, can I just also say, sure. also we've got to do a better job at connecting the dots. Yeah. That this isn't just about funding the dreams of let's say 22 to 30 to 35 medals and medalists, right? That this is about what they then do to inspire a nation of young people to get involved in sport and what sport then teaches communities to do. And communities come together, they learn about communication and leadership and teamwork and how to win and how to lose and those skills transfer to everything you do in your life. Skylar spoke about that. So that if we can do a better job at convincing Canadians that that's what the Olympic Games are about. It's not about just helping those couple dozen, three dozen dreams, mm -hmm. but it's about helping the dreams of the whole country. Yeah. Then I think we, do, we, we are more successful. Couldn't agree more, couldn't agree more. And, and, and ahead of this conversation, we were talking about legacy, and of course you look at the 2015 Pan Am Games, I just spent a week out at the, at the Pan Am Sports Centre watching our Canadian swimmers who are going to uh, just light up the pool in Paris. That's a direct legacy of the Pan Am Games in 2015. That's where our national team is getting great to take on the world. Uh, winding down, Bruni, uh, you know all about the ultimate team. You were a part of it in Atlanta. In that, in that uh, documentary I watched, there was some friction too, which I liked about that. Watch it <laughs> if you're on a flight. But tell me about this Canadian chemistry, this unparalleled and unrivaled Canadian chemistry that when we go out in the world and we are on the biggest athletic stages, it is the teamwork of the maple leaf and of the red and white that always seems to rise above. Yeah, it's very important, the, the, the team uh, spirit. The, the confidence that, uh, because like you said, Scala, we're going to the Olympics, like the, a lot of the athletes, they are in the, 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 the prime, they are in the, the top shape. What you've been working on and practice over and over and over again, although you know the competition is, is there, and that's what we as a team built. And in 95, 94, 95, 96 at the Olympics, we were, the team, we were like sync, just like this. We were like brothers, although we were not the, f the favorite. Mm -hmm. When you look at the, the, the comparison with the USA team, who were the favorite, all the media were only talking about them. Right. We were like absent, but us, what we create during <coughs> practice, during training camps and everything, and when I look at the, the eyes of my, my teammates, oh my God, we were ready. <laughs> we were ready. The only thing was that was in my mind, we're going to kick ass. And we did. <laughs> you know, Brody, when you were just saying over and over and over, I, w I was imagining a perfect baton pass every yes. time you were doing that. You didn't miss it. Uh, David, uh, there's a dance floor in front of us here. A breaking is going to be part of the Olympic program. Yes. Phil Wizard, uh, one of the top ranked breakers, and Skylar, I know you and the family have gotten to know him well. But when we just talk about uh, new sports being added to the Olympic program and flares of, of local communities, I know LA has their own idea of what sports should be added. Maybe take the audience a little bit through as we wind down how uh, these new sports are added to Olympic programs because uh, it's going to be riveting in Paris. Well, yeah, it's a little more art than science. And right. A lot depends on the host organizing committee and what they'd like to see. Uh, they don't have a lot of latitude, but with every Olympic Games, there's a, a couple of sports which will, will likely come off the program and the host organizer can then suggest a couple that will come on. And it has a lot to do with... Uh, the, the, the local flair of the games, what they, what they want to be the, the calling card of the games. Um, so in the case of Paris in particular, sticking with some of the new sports that were added in Tokyo, surfing and sport climbing and, and skateboarding, and then adding breaking, which is incredible to watch. And yes, Phil Wizard is uh, Philip Kim, I'm sure, <laughs> right. for the, uh, is what it will say. Philip Kim can, will be next to his name. Um, at the Olympic Games, I think will electrify. But yeah, looking ahead, Los Angeles um, really trying to, um, much like 1984 did, transform the Olympic Games. 
uh, has added a whole host of new sports that I think will try to serve the Olympic movement well going into the future, lacrosse and, and cricket and squash, which will make its Olympic debut. Somebody will say, no, no, it was on the program in 1904 or something like right. that. But, <laughs> but it should, it, it's, and that's because Los Angeles really wants to sort of embrace some of these sports that are, are practiced all around the world and, and competed in, yeah. Good. Uh, Skylar, last word to you. Uh, draped in a beautiful outfit, a beautiful kit. I think you said this is a travel in the media kit <laughs> it in is, Paris. Yes. Uh, but you once again get to represent your country. Um, and thank goodness your family chose Canada. We've talked about that. What's it mean to you? And uh, final word to our audience as you get set to represent Canada once again internationally. Yeah, it's always such an honor. I mean, like, like Bruni had said, to put on the tracksuit um, and to feel that you're a part of something so much bigger than yourself. I mean, representing Canada at international events anywhere is, is, is an honor, but especially at the pinnacle of, of sport at the Olympic Games. Um, I mean, even in Tokyo, when there is no fans in the stands, you can really feel the energy and feel what it's like to, to represent something bigger than yourself, and, and in my case, to fight for something bigger than yourself. Um, and I think, like he said, having that team atmosphere and the whole Team Canada, I mean, everyone I've met is incredible. And, and just having that team camaraderie, I think, me coming from Winnipeg, um, there's not too many members of the Olympic team from Winnipeg, um, especially me training in my gym with my brothers and my dad. Um, sometimes it's nice once you step outside that bubble and to feel like you're part of this huge team of athletes, um, the, the leader of the team being Mr. Surin and, and being beside, um, <laughs> being beside Andre de Grasse and Penny Alexiak and all these incredible Canadian Olympians. Um, and to know that we're all on the same team, I think especially as a younger athlete, that gave me a lot of strength knowing that, okay, like I'm not just some little girl from Winnipeg with her dad, you know, coaching her, you right, know? Right. <laughs> um, so no, it's, it's always definitely such an honor. And I think even after Tokyo, when it didn't go the way that I'd hoped, and I was very, very disappointed with the result and, and for, for quite a while, um, I think to come back home to Canada and just see that I still had so many people rooting for me and supporting me, um, I think that was huge as well, knowing that we support our athletes no matter what. Um, I think that meant the most, for sure. Special. Well, we have your back. <laughs> we can't wait to celebrate you and cheer you on in Paris. My bosses would be mad if I didn't say that. There will be 22 hours every day of live <laughs> coverage on CBC Sports on every platform. Um, I'm going to be on the pool deck for the first week and at track and field for the second week. I can't wait to talk to our athletes. It's an unparalleled time across the board, depth and talent like we've never seen. It will be a French renaissance, and our Canadian athletes are ready. What a powerhouse team here today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Devin. Thank you, Skylar. Thank you, David. Thank you, Bruni. All right. And thanks again to all our sponsors uh, for their support and everyone joining us today in person or online. I'm going to deviate just a little bit. Uh, it is Asian Heritage Month, and uh, it's an opportunity for all of us to learn about uh, the diverse culture and history of Asian communities in Canada, as well as to acknowledge uh, the many contributions. And in that spirit, for those of you that know me, I do have a soft spot for entrepreneurs, and uh, had occasion to meet uh, the folks behind Wondermock, Jun Goon, who's in the room today, and they're purveyors of fine Korean rice wine, and so. We, we do have someone that has won one of these uh, products, and so I uh, encourage you to meet with our team in the back there, and that's Abarnan Vasanthan. So Abarnan, congratulations, but uh, uh, more importantly, I, I, I wanted to take the time to, in the spirit of Asian Heritage Month, and as well as the entrepreneurship in, in these folks here, acknowledge uh, June Goon uh, from Wandermock. I uh, would now like to invite Bob Varuela Jr., who's the National Program Director of Unity Charity, 
and Mahad Shoaib, the Development Director of Unity Charity, to uh, present a showcase celebrating the debut of the sport of breaking. We just heard about breaking at the 2024 Summer Olympics. Check, check. All right. Thank you so much. We want to first give a big shout out to the Empire Club of Canada for having us today. Can we get a big round of applause for Empire Club? And huge shout out to Arcadian Court for this amazing service and lunch. Thank you so much for having us. We are so excited to be here. My name is Mahad Shoei. I'm the Development Director at Unity Charity. We are a national nonprofit organization that uses hip hop to build resilience among youth. Now, hearing the fantastic panelists talk about resilience made me think about how we're all kind of in this thing together. And so our story begins in 2007. There is a fantastic breakdancer, b-boy, his name is Michael Prosterman. He wanted to give back what the dance community gave to him, which was a sense of belonging, skills, community. Now, 17 years later, we have carried on that legacy. We have served more than 500,000 youth across the country to date. <laughs> Everything we do is completely free. We have performances, we have workshops, we have events, training initiatives, career development, mentorship, you name it, we got it. Now, looking ahead, we are hosting a huge celebration on July 20th at Harborfront Center. It's part of our annual event called the Unity Festival. This is where every single hip hop art form comes together under one roof. So you have breaking, you have rap, you have beatboxing, you have graffiti, everything all happening in the same place at the same time. If you're interested, please mark it down in your calendars. July 20th, Harborfront Center, 1 to 9 p.m., free event, all ages, everyone is welcome. And we are so, so excited to talk to you a little bit more about why we are here today. Bob, why are we here today? Why are we here today? My name is Bob, National Program Director, Unity Charity. We are actually going to do a breaking demonstration to celebrate breaking in the Olympics. Who's seen breaking before here? Has anyone seen breaking in person? Ooh, okay, a couple hands All right, went okay. up. All right, okay, okay. So what I'm gonna do first is we're gonna get everybody to stand up and come towards the dance floor. We need this hip-hop vibe, you know what I'm saying? to the dance floor. Get a pop of your thing. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna spark it up right before the weekend, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We get ready to party here. Come on in, come on in. Come on, don't be Let's shy. Let's like a busking show, floor. you know what I'm saying? Come on in. Hip-hop is in the building. Yes, yes, yes. Don't be shy. Come on in. We won't, we won't bite. So, I, I'm also from Winnipeg. Shout out to Winnipeg. Woo! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I've been dancing for about 30 years as a b-boy, and uh, hip-hop has come a long way. So it's, uh, for it to be part of the, Olymp the, uh, the Olympics, and it really means a lot to our community. It really shows that the young people that come from these different parts of the, of the world, that there's another avenue and a pathway uh, through dance, through a culture that you enjoy, and we want to we want to bring awareness and also show the beauty of our dance. So we're really excited to have it uh, at the Olympics. And can we give it one more time for hip hop culture in the building, please? <laughs> <laughs> it's such a special moment. So so today we're gonna do a bit of a demonstration. We got some young people that have attended our programming in the past, which have now become some of the best dancers in Canada Woo. and the world. So without further ado, we got Bryce, Montu, and JC Fresh, the unknown floor force. Please put your hands together. Make some noise. Come on, yo. <laughs> Just very quickly, I'm going to do a call and response to see if y'all can get into it. Party people, if you're ready to rock, let me hear you scream. Oh, we can do better than that. Party people, if you're ready to rock, let me hear you scream. 
And if you're really, really ready to party, then let me hear everybody say, we came to party. We came to party. Say, we came to party. We came to party. DJ, drop that beat. Let's get this show started. Make some noise for Unknown Floor Force. If you like what you see, make some noise. Turn up the beat. Turn up the beat. Turn it up. Let's go. Hey. Let's go. Okay. Hey. 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 Fresh, 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 fresh. Unknown for force. Let's go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Boy, Bryce. All right. Keeping it fresh. JC Fresh, let's go. Check the style. What do you got, Jason? Music, music. Play by.
go, Mark. What you got? Ah, uh, yeah. What you know about the flares? Ah. Uh, that ain't easy, yo. Let's go, Bryce. Give it up for Unknown Floor Force! We are Unity Charity. Big shout out to Empire Club for having us. Thank you so Good much. Good luck to all the Canadian athletes in the Olympic Committee. We out of here. Peace! Yeah, if you want to learn more, check us out at unitycharity.com or talk to one of us. We're around for a little while. Thank you again for having us. Big shout out to Empire Club. Pass it back to Sal. Back to you. What a great performance. Thank you all for your participation. This meeting is now adjourned.